Welcome to the Saatchi Gallery and welcome to this discussion entitled New Directions in Contemporary Photography. I'm Charlotte Cotton, I'm your chair this evening and it's with really great pleasure that I'm introducing a really exceptional panel of three incredibly creative people who have um, a great deal intellectually and emotionally invested in the future of contemporary art photography. Um, at the end, we have Aaron Schumann, who's a multi-talented photo fiend. <laughs> He's a photographer uh, who makes bodies of work that offer new departures, I'd say, in photography's rich history that was developed in the 20th century. And Aaron is a really talented photographic educator, and he's also a curator and a writer for international venues and photography publications, as well as the edi editor of an online magazine that he founded in 2004, Seesaw Magazine. Um, Clarice Darsimols is a really exciting new voice um, that photography is desperate to call its own, although you could also call it um, photography in relation to performance. Uh, since, she, since graduate school, and she was at Central St. Martins, Clarice has experimented across the gamut of performance and photography. And she's just about to have her first solo show in London, which I think is at Viner Street, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Opening on February the 3rd. Anne Hardy's staged photographs often have their genesis in a curious object that she comes across in the course of her daily life which she builds into these really strange theatrical scenes for, for her camera, which, some of which are on show in this exhibition. She's been one of very few younger photographers to have had a sustained and international presence in the commercial and non-profit gallery ecosystem. Um, it wasn't until we, um, we arrived this evening that we realised that there wasn't going to be a projector, so um, our three panellists had prepared some short... There's someone waving. Is that to say you can't hear? No. Um, uh, that we, you had prepared presentations with uh, slideshows. So rather than the kind of pure torture of you presenting without your slides describing your work or us having to draw pictures, we decided to go really straight into our discussion and some key questions that we, we posed ourselves this afternoon. But really, when that conversation begins to draw to a close, we want to move as soon as possible into your questions and observations. I mean, obviously, there's lots of people here who are similarly invested in the future of contemporary art photography. So hopefully, we'll, we'll move th rattle through, and it's a good thing that we're not looking at any pictures. Um, uh, to, to, I started out in photography as a, a volunteer at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1992. And it was, as it turned out, I obviously didn't know that at the time, it was a really interesting year for photography as contemporary art. It was really the first year when you were seeing major international touring shows of people like Nobuyoshi Araki and Nan Golden. I didn't know that. My reason for wanting to be with photography was more to do with people, photographers' work from the early to mid 20th century, like Bill Brandt, who I'd really adored. Uh, and I'd also been really lucky at um, undergraduate to be taught by Thomas Crow, uh, Professor Thomas Crow, who had taught me about the basic language of postmodernism and post postmodernism. Um, but immediately I got this internship at the VA. It became evident that you know, there was this thing called a photographic culture. And there was obviously a, quite a lot of baggage to that, that idea. There might even have been something like a cultural war, a war about what was at stake in trying to legitimize photography as an art form. So I started to have to, f you know, form my view about what photography was and what its relationship to contemporary art in relation to this kind of new energy and this new sort of optimism that photography was clearly part of the mechanisms of this thing called contemporary art, but also conscious that there were these communities that still existed and had been formed you know, in my lifetime who had been really there to try and legitimise photography as an art form against the odds. So I wanted to start by asking each of you in turn about the, the point at which you made that commitment to photography. What was the landscape? What, were you, what did you think you were entering into? Um, well, I think my, my background was a, a broad fine art degree um, where I was predominantly painting. 
And at a certain point after leaving my degree course, I felt that um, what I wanted to do with my work, it wasn't really possible within painting anymore. So I looked, and I'd always looked at a lot of photography, all different kinds. And so I decided to start working with photography. And I was at that point, I was staging, I was always staging scenes. I always um, saw photography in a way as a way to realize something that was in my head, not necessarily as a formed visual image, but a, a way to bring together lots of different things that I was thinking about, conceptual things, formal things, all sorts of different things like that. So I think I, I've always used photography as a tool very much from the beginning. I never really thought about it having a kind of separate existence within different communities in that way until a later point. I went to the Royal College and did a photography MA um, when I became much more... I guess, much more aware of these different areas within the photographic community and that there were different balances in the way that people saw the medium. But I think for me, it's always, it's been a way, it's been a tool to realise something that I wanted to do and it it's works the best way out of anything that I could choose at the current moment. But So I'm deeply attached to it in that way, but I think if there was something else at a future point that would, would work as well, then I would use that too. Yeah. And when, what, when were you at RCA? I was at the RCA from 98 to 2000. And did you, were you meeting with any kind of resistance, either from tutors or viewers of your work, to treating photography as a tool? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I yeah. think in the group of students that I was with at that point, um, there were, at that time, not very many of us in the MA. There were 15 in each year and two years, so 30 altogether. And there was a really diverse range of practices within that, of what people were involved with. And we were all connected by something quite practical in a way. And so the conceptual discussions yeah. around that were, you know, from lots of different angles. But I don't think there was really a resistance to things being one way or another way, because we were such a wide-ranging group. Yeah. And so there was, by that sort of late 90s, a sense of well, within the art school, the supportive mm. environment of the art school, a sort of coexistence of these different <coughs> versions of yeah. photography. I would yeah, I'd say within that group of people, definitely. And there weren't huge... There were, no, there definitely weren't big distinctions drawn between one, one and the other, other than that one person might consider their realisation occurring in a different way or in a different place than another person, yeah. Yeah. In Clarice, what's, I mean, you're, you're relatively recently graduated from Central yeah, St. Martin's. Like a year and a half ago, so everything went quite fast for me. So what I did is a set design for performance course first. So I was 19 and I wanted to be a set designer. But step by step, I, disco I discovered photography and I spent all my, all my spare time. I was like in the dark room, like learning about 35 May, 120. And I started to really like it. So I decided to complete like a postgraduate course in photography in Central St. Martins as well, you know, in the idea of mixing the two together, you know, and do some <laughs> photography mise en scène, you know. And, and I think it, it's, you know, it's fascinating for me to do both, you know. And, but I, I'm also not, I'm, I can use as well like installation, video or photography, you know, depending of what I'm talking about. So yeah. it's, it's a tool for me for sure, you know, but not the only one. <laughs> who, who were you learning that sort of basic darkroom techniques from? And it, you're talking about a wet darkroom, I guess. Honestly, it, it just like I was in the darkroom and I was learning on my own a bit. I had a, a teacher who's here <laughs> and he, he teached me a bit, you know, and I had this first solo show when I was 19, you know, and he showed me a bit. And, and I think it was naturally my, the medium I really liked. But mm. yeah, at the beginning, I, I was really interested by set design. But I think I, I, I now do both, you know, and I could go back to set design as well, you know, but yeah. Yeah. And it, it, from, uh, particularly from when we were talking earlier, it seems that, um, you know, in a way, if there was a war, it is definitely over because for someone graduating in the 2000s, you clearly have very little baggage about whether mm -hmm. what you're producing is art or, or not, or photography or, yeah. or not. I think what is fascinating about my generation is just that... When I was studying, I was learning everything about even making a pinhole camera, you know, I was learning like 35 mil, like all the different cameras. And as well, I had to learn the technology, you know, and I had to go through all the technology. And I think at the beginning, like it took lots of time for photography to be accepted as fine art, you know, but now it became like a really vast playground, you know. Mm. And, and I think 
yeah, I mean, everything became like permitted and accessible and possible, yeah. I think. Um, Aaron, are you feeling similarly <coughs> light as a feather or what's, what's your back history with photography? Well, my history, um, I, was, I studied in New York, so um, I started off, the first photography that I did was in high school, and I had a teacher that was um, a Navajo Native American, um, and she uh, put out a call for a grant that she um, won for students to go and visit the reservation in Arizona. So, um, and so I pitched the idea that I could um, do a photo essay, basically. And so I got very involved in kind of documentary photography, but in a very... Um, mid 20th century way and became obsessed with uh, photography, kind of anything that was produced before 1970 in black and white, um, 35 mil was kind of what I was really interested in at the time. Mm. Um, and so the obvious place was to go to New York um, where there seemed to be, this was in the mid 90s, so there was a very kind of thriving photographic, you know, photo dedicated galleries, museums, places where you could easily go and see vintage prints by W. Eugene Smith or Paul Strand or Cartier-Bresson or Robert Frank. You know, you could interact with that work on a specifically um, photographic level. Um, at the time, I was studying um, the history of art as well, but I wasn't, um, I was engaging with it through kind of photography. And I, there was no kind of insecurity in my mind for photography. Um, so, but my, but my, my interest at the time was very much historical. Um, and I wasn't, I was very much in denial about the fact that that world had kind of disappeared in terms of <laughs> the editorial life magazine kind of world. I was very romantic that, oh, oh that's, that's what I'm going to do, that's what I'm going to be. Um, uh, and when I got to New York, I started, I got an internship at a few galleries that um, uh, represented up-and-coming photographers at the time, so that included Wolfgang Tillmans and um, Gregory Crudson. So I was being exposed to how photography was entering the art market and entering kind of the fine art, Larry Clark was one of the um, artists as well that was at one of the galleries that I was interning at. And so that was a kind of strange shock for me at the time to kind of see how this contemporary work was being integrated into a, a fine art context. Um, could, you, could you see the difference? I could see, I didn't understand it. I mean, to be perfectly frank, I didn't, I didn't understand the, the, the appeal or, I mean, I could see the relevance in terms of, um, but I saw it, again, very much like a, I saw those, those artists very much as people who were using photography as a tool within fine art. So, you know, that, that debate that's now kind of irrelevant between the photographic artist and the photographer, um, you know, was something that I was really trying to come to terms with at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then on top of that, after I had worked at the galleries, I did an internship with Annie Leibovitz, which is, which is a completely different ball game, you know, in a completely different world of photography. But at the time, people like Annie Leibovitz and, and uh, Avedon really appealed to me because they were very much harking back to the glory days of, of kind of, uh, you know, glamour photography of the, you know, not glamour, but, you know, kind of Irving Penn, Snowden. And the, and the idea that the, the commercial system photography would support these kind of half a dozen sort of major characters who basically monopolized commercial image. Yeah, material. absolutely. And it was a completely unrealistic kind of environment to be in as a, as a student, <laughs> right. as a 19 year old student to kind of realize that, you know, somebody had a, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollar budget to go off and shoot Arnold Schwarzenegger on the top of a, a mountain, you know, and rent helicopters. You know, all of that stuff was like this. I, I'm not going to be this. First. There's no way that I, you know, I'm not going to strive to be this person, but I'm not also, you know, it's such a limited space, and yeah. that space is disappearing quite quickly. So um, it was only until I moved, when I moved to the UK was when I realized that there was a real kind of friction or change going on between how photography was being perceived within a fine art context. Which year did you move here? The first time I came here was in 99, and when I arrived, it was, um, there was a lot of hype in the newspapers because Tillman's had been... Um, nominated for the Turner Prize, and it was the first time a photographer had been included in the Turner Prize. And so, um, I've told this story before, but I went, I went to, the, to see the Turner Prize because I was like, oh, that's cool, photography's you know, big in the UK too. And, um, but I turned up at the, the Tate with my kind of Nikon F2 35 mil with Tri-X black and white film in my camera. You know, and, I, and I went into the exhibition and stayed for about two hours trying to, to kind of grasp it and walked out and literally just stared at the Thames for about 45 minutes just thinking, I don't, you know, I'm going to have to really 
I have to study all over again because because what I know and what's happening here is really um, dramatic and dramatically different. Mm. So so it wasn't a rejection of it, but it was more of a kind of I felt like I'd been thrown in the deep end to a certain extent. Um, yeah. And and what and what did you do next? <laughs> um, well, three weeks later, well, Tillman ended up winning the Turner Prize, and I saw an, an advertisement online at a jobs listing for um, Wolfgang Tillman seeking a, a color printer. Yeah. So I applied for the job and ended up kind of three weeks later being in his studio kind of printing two days a week. So, <laughs> yeah, it was a, and, and that was a really good way of kind of figuring out what he was doing and how he was doing it and why he was doing it, because I could, I could yeah. understand the environment and the space and, and the ideas that he was dealing with. And also I could look at his bookshelf and realize that he wasn't only, you know, he was interested in the same things I was in, in terms of yeah. Eggleston or, you know, the, the history of photography was very much a part of his work as much as anybody else's. It just wasn't as obvious to me at the time because it, it wasn't in black and white and it wasn't grainy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it was, some of it's grainy, but yeah. And I mean, again, it's sort of like a, a question for all of you about what, what you thought you were entering into or what you were aiming, to, aiming for by, I mean, what was this thing, contemporary art photography? Um. Um, I don't think I, I guess I never really thought about it exactly in that framework as well, it, maybe, was maybe I, it was what it was meant, you know. Maybe maybe another way of putting it is to be a bit more literal about it is did you were you considering first and foremost the gallery the the context for your photography? I think when I first started making photographs, I didn't really think about where they were going to go at all. I just knew that there were things that I really wanted to make, and I felt that that was the way to realise the things I wanted to make was with a photograph rather than with a painting or drawing or something. And I think later, once I'd made the first, I guess the first like set of images that I made was probably about 10 of them, which is what I applied to the Royal College with. Um, then I started to, sort of in that period, that was around 1997, I guess, when I started making images, early 97. And then, yeah, so about... Within a year, I started to think, well, what do I want to do with these images now I have? You know, and I started printing them in a friend's darkroom. I learned printing from somebody, you know, and would just go and print in the night time when um, the photographer whose darkroom it was wasn't printing himself. So I would spend, like, night printing things and thinking, yeah, that looks really great. And then it would be completely blue or cyan or something else. But at that point, I couldn't really see the difference. And then <laughs> after a while, I had, you know, a, a set of images that I was happy with and excited about. And I thought, well, what do I want to do with them now? And I felt very strongly that they should be quite big because I felt it was about the sort of somehow, if you would look at them, it was to do with this sort of encounter with a space and with a situation that was in the image. So it should be quite large so that you could feel the space and see the detail and the information in the image. Um, so I made, so then I did, I made them, I think they were about four foot by five foot, those images, again, in another friend's darkroom who had an access to a large machine. And I printed them up and I, I made a show of them in an uh, empty warehouse beneath the studio space where I was living and working at that right. point. And without, I suppose without thinking about it, I'd done something that a lot of other people had done at that stage, which was to make large colour photographs. But at that point in time, I hadn't really, I hadn't considered that at all. You know, it was, it was, I just felt that that's what I wanted to do with them because I needed them to be big. And perhaps because I'd come from a paint, you know, I'd been painting before that. And in comparison to paintings I'd made, they were actually really small. <laughs> so there was that, I had perhaps that kind of relationship to thinking about scale and, and how something would sit on a wall mm. um, in relation to what I wanted to do with the work. But yeah, I, I guess I, I mean, thinking back through that then, yeah, I always thought that they would perhaps be on a wall at the point when I started thinking about what were they beyond beyond the kind of um, work print that one has in the darkroom to see what you have, which is like a kind of indicator of something in a way. It's yeah. not a work in itself. Beyond that, I felt that there would be something on a wall rather than a book, yeah. a book work or um, But very, yeah. mu very much from the perspective of a painter who would 
be standing back and ultimately seeing something on a wall rather than a sort of photographer with a chip on your shoulder of, oh my God, I've got to make it 30 by 40 or nobody's going to even consider it art. Yeah, I had no, that kind of conversation I had no idea about until <laughs> quite a lot later and I was quite surprised and shocked by it because I thought surely the, you, know, you make these decisions according to what you want something to do. But yeah, I made it very much from the perspective of, yeah, of having been a painter and looked thought about things on walls and mm. how they occupy space and what your relationship is to them as a person when you come and look at that thing and, you know, how scale affects that and, you know, that whole relationship, yeah. yeah. I mean, Clarice, for you, I mean, does size matter? I mean, is it... I didn't really have to choose the scale because, like, my project is about restaging some old family snapshot years after, years after so I just decided to keep the original snapshot and to just recreate it exactly in the same way. Mm. So, like, yeah, the scale was fine, you know, but I couldn't have expected that a year and a half later I would be at the Sachi exhibiting my work, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think... It's not good to have a sense of entitlement that that is where <laughs> 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 no. um, and what, about, what about you, Aaron? Do you, do you feel that you've sort of had to think through the politics of size in... To a certain extent, yeah. I mean, I've kind of... <clears throat> I developed this kind of voracious appetite for not only making photographs, but also kind of consuming photographs and looking at them and critiquing them and trying to, to kind of spread the word and champion them. So I, I became really kind of interested in not only content, but also form and how those forms kind of took on new meanings in different places. And I think, you know, most recently, the work that I've been making is very much kind of responded to um, not only kind of the content of the images and the, the concept behind the idea, behind, behind the projects, but also kind of responding to where I want that, that work to be. So, yeah. so two years ago, I made a body of work that was very much kind of large scale, um, large format, uh, and presented for a kind of gallery exhibition. The next body of work I made was very much kind of a response in black and white to, to kind of, I'd seen Cortege's um, uh, small contact prints from the, from his time in the military and kind of early mm -hmm. 20th century and really responded to the way that, I really enjoyed the way that I responded to that work in the gallery space. The fact yeah. that I was sucked in rather than over, over kind of overwhelmed um, yeah. and they become something quite precious. So, so I started making work like that. And then the most recent body of work I made is a series of postcards, which is um, again, just another departure um, in response to somebody else's work. So yeah, um, yeah, so, so yeah it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that I'm really interested in, but I think you know, I think um, photography within a fine art context is is really valid, but I think it can exist in lots of other contexts as well in equally valid ways. Um, and I like experimenting with those yeah. things. Yeah. I think I think what's what's interesting is that um, the sort of the 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 meaning and the values of the final form of photography really does impact on the experience and it's I mean in in your individual ways you were talking very much about being very sentient to what the form needs to be in order to have the viewer to have the experience that you want mm. of the work because being slightly more cynical and not being a practitioner so I can say what I like you know I mean if you were feeling cynical you would say that okay well actually there are these trends in size and production values, which potentially, one would say, are either strongly market-driven or driven by a motivation to make work that looks like contemporary art. Mm. So, for example, in the very late 90s, if you wanted it to signal immediately, this is contemporary art photography, it would be 30 by 40 inches backed on a sheet of aluminium, no frame. And that was like the most neutral statement, but clear statement of being contemporary art. And then by the mid 2000s, if it wasn't laminated behind plexiglass, then how the hell were you to know it isn't a contemporary art photograph and the bigger, the better. Mm -hmm. And these kind of trends and there being a real, um, Obviously, there being a really important distinction between those being the default production values of this thing called contemporary art and actually the production values which leads the viewer to the specific message of the work. I mean, because in a different way, like your, your photographs, Clarice, um, you know, inherently you want people to immediately get the relationship mm -hmm. with vernacular family 
yeah. photographer. And, and because this talk is about the new direction of photography, I think it's really interesting for me to... I'm wondering, you know, like, because I'm the last generation of uh, family albums and print photographs, you know, I'm wondering in, like, 50 years, 100 years' time, you know, how those, like, family pictures, like, this fictional past of a real past will be perceived, you know. And I think it was really important for me to keep the same size, because if I had to put make them bigger, you know, like, you go out of the family albums, you know, it, it becomes, like, something else, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> for me, I mean, talking about new directions, I think what's become really interesting from my perspective is that I think a lot of um, photographers are now starting to deal not only with single images and the object and the form of the image, but they're also starting to, to deal and uh, interrogate and experiment with um, the relationship between images and what happens in the space in between them, whether it's through sequencing in a book or through collections of work on a wall where, they're, where pictures are responding to each other. So it's becoming a lot more dynamic and complicated. So it's no longer just simply an, a single image behind plexi on a, on a wall, yeah. but it, it, it's become um, multi-dimensional and, and existing of multiple images. Um, and people are, are kind of looking at the space in between, you know, in between pictures. Um, when they're placed next to one another in a sequence and so on. And I think also that that indicates that in terms of the direction that photography is heading, from my perspective, what's interesting is that I think photography is often seen as the kind of final form of somebody's idea. Like it's the culmination of what they've, um, they've been thinking about and trying to experiment with and trying to produce over a number of weeks, years, whatever. And I think now what's happening is that a lot of people are starting to use photographs as, as instigators for right. ideas. You know, so they've, bec they've kind of reversed it in a sense um, and using, using the photograph as a starting point rather than as the end point um, in really interesting ways. Um, and that, for me, that's really promising. I really enjoy that, that kind yeah. of that playfulness of photography, that it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that can grow and change and develop and um, inspire new ideas and relate to other images, you know, and whether that's down to Google Images or, you know, the development of self-published books or whatever, I don't know, but I think it's, it, that, that's a new life that photography is kind of breathing. Well, actually, I mean, clearly you do have some thoughts on why that might be, why photography is either in a secure enough position as a contemporary art form mm. to, to be more diverse. Or I think it might be, it might have reached a certain state of maturity where there's a a wide enough audience, there's a certain confidence, there's a certain understanding, you know, not, not necessarily a complex understanding, but a, but a general understanding of how images work, you know, in a, in a public realm. Um, I don't, I mean, I think people are willing to give it a chance now, and they're willing, they don't want to, they don't necessarily want to walk into a space and kind of be told how, what to think or how to inter, in, interpret a work or how to engage with the work. They, they kind of, they like the notion of being kind of sent off on a journey mm. um, and, and kind of being able to discover something or, or interpret something, you know, in their own way. Um, yeah, and I just think that I think it's a really exciting aspect of photography today. I, mean, I was yeah. going to say, it's, quite, it's interesting that um, what you were saying about the, multi, you know, the multiple, mm -hmm. multiplicity of images in a way and that becoming, because I feel like I'm still trying to get even, because I work very much with the single image, but almost yeah. trying to get even further away from many, which has always been, mm -hmm. I guess the expectation with photography is that you would have lots of them because you can more easily and trying to find a way that where one in the room is, is plenty in a way that that's trying to sort of pare it down and back to this point where the single image can yeah. exist very much on its own and, you, and those kind of relationships and journey can happen inside somehow. I, but I think, in that, I think within a fine art context that functions incredibly well because with, within this context people, are, people are, are conditioned to kind of um, experience and you know, um, respond to work in, you mean in the context of it actually being a, an object in space as opposed to in a printed page? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. Course, yeah. And also, you know, I mean, in the history of the museum and the fact that, that kind of painting is, is a kind of relevant thing, so again, size and, and kind of form and... Um, yeah. I mean, it, in, a, in, a, in a way, I mean, actually, I'm going to ask you a different, another question, which is, um, you, you know, your practice has been really consistent over, what, 
say seven, eight years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's a, that's a long time where actually you do you do work with in this very considered. It's obscenely slow, <laughs> and um, so it's like one work every. I'm about four every uh, four three to four a year. Yeah. And I mean, that's obviously something you're really committed to doing. That is what you need to be doing right now. But do you think that in this, in the last, in the period you've been working, the reaction to your work or the understanding of your work has shifted in relation to what Aaron's talking about, which is really a kind of a, a less baggaged relationship with photography as contemporary art? Um, I'm not sure, really. I think. It's really hard. I, I'm not really sure. I think... Um, so, no, I don't know. It's probably about the same, I would say, in relationship to how people look at and understand the work, because I think, consistently, some people have always got that it exists in a certain way, and then also the opposite, that some people don't understand it existing yeah. in that way. So, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that, you know, even... Six, seven or eight years ago, a photographic print, we still talked about that as, as the obvious sort of end result of making a photograph. Whereas, mm. of course, in that time, what's happened in our daily lives is, and even in our family lives, the physical print is not something that many yeah. people see very often. So it immediately means that even if you do nothing differently, mm. the value of seeing this gorgeous, big, clearly considered, very active set of choices, which is a physical print of mm. yours, is more pronounced, even if you're doing nothing, you're motivated. No, yeah, I completely, no, I completely see what, what you mean. I think, um, I think um, the, lar like the large photographic image perhaps has always been more surprising anyway, yeah. because it's big. But I agree that, like, as the f as the physicality of the everyday photograph disappears, it doesn't really have a physical existence so much anymore. That, so therefore, the physicality of another kind of photographic image becomes more present, or you become more aware of it. But I think probably with my work, the thing that um, the thing that I encounter most is people's reaction is to the way that the photographs have come into existence more than the fact that you it know that whether print, they yeah. are. Um, a big print or or whatever it's more to do with the process behind them that causes the the surprise if you like or the kind of reaction to them as a medium because i think some people find that quite perverse with a you know it is quite perverse with a photographic image that you would spend so long making one of them but you know but i think conversely there's plenty already so we don't need mm. to make lots of them and in a way the photograph allows a lot you know the single image allows a lot of things to come into being within one image yeah. i don't think yeah do you think that um, you talked about you mentioned self publishing and what i think we've seen in the last couple of years is this real renaissance of the idea as the book form as one which is a, a original form for photographers and artist books are on the ascendance. Do you think that that's also because of the fact that we can see it as a, a see it as a material rather than just as a default platform? I mean, you know, the publishing world is really having to reinvent itself like most creative industries right now. So, you know, whereas in the mid 90s, after Richard Billingham published, had Re Scarlo published Raise a Laugh, what, in 96? It, you know, every photographer under 30 felt slightly inadequate if they didn't have a trade book, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 5,000 copies, and that sort of fell away as the industry went into crisis. But as a result, self-publishing seems to have merged as this really vibrant, creative form. I think it's... I mean, I've, I've, t I've talked quite a lot, and I've, that's one thing that I've seen that's very exciting, the way that a lot of students develop their work at the end of their degree, is really looking to the book as a format that they can not only, you know, dream about as an idea, but, like, they can really work with it as, a, as another medium, in a way. And I think mm -hmm. that has completely changed because it's become something that's completely accessible for anyone to work with in the same way as um, yeah. a print or whatever else. Yeah. And I think that makes lots of different... That makes lots of different things happen within work. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the, um, the self-publishing aspect of... I mean, the explosion of kind of self-publishing, I think, is exciting in a lot of ways because 
at least the best of them, the best, the best of those works are people that are really experimenting, again, with a format, with a kind of context, and a way of, of making that as dynamic as possible. So instead of it being simply um, a stamp of approval, like you've been, you've been given a book, and, and here's a collection of works, and now you are famous. You know, yeah. It's become something that people, first of all, they, they consider themselves very, very preciously, you know, and, they, and they, they pour their heart and soul into it. It's really flexible and easy to, to kind of manipulate and change and, and play with. Yeah. Um, it's something that other, that's accessible to a, an audience, so even if you self-publish 100 editions, you can find 100 people you know, that, that will buy it you know, for 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and, and savor it and treasure it. And you know, so it's, it's become something that's, that's, um, you know, yeah, that's, 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 that's heartfelt and, yeah. and honest. And I mean, honest is a big word, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's something that feels genuine, genuinely invested in. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying that kind of fine art works and fine art prints aren't, but, it's, but those aren't things that are necessarily going to be entirely accessible to a, to a big audience or, um, you know, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it, it, again, it also goes down to that relationship between images, I think, is it offers an opportunity to produce a body of work rather than a work. Yeah, um, and, and to really sort of embrace, I guess, many of the permissions that Tillman's gave, which was to treat your photographs as this sort of raw material, this ever-growing archive, which is then it's in the way that you install it and publish it. Yeah. The full, yeah, know, I mean, I think there's, a narrative comes I mean, out. I think there's certain limits that should probably be imposed in that respect. Yeah. There are plenty of self-published books where people just <coughs> randomly make photographs and randomly throw them together. And maybe that's the experiment. Maybe it's about randomness and, yeah. and that relationship. You know, that's fine. I think, you know, but sometimes it's, a, I think it's a matter of kind of, you know, intent and, um, and I think it's also, also it sort of it picks up where, I mean, one, one other thing that happened in the 2000s was the production values of photographic prints sort of went to this large scale. You saw the sort of closure of a lot of dark rooms. And so, um, and the, the market hadn't really accepted pigment prints or Epsom prints as something that was slightly suspicious of it. So there wasn't really a sort of democratic way of to, to DIY. Suddenly you had to have a relationship with a printer and, you know, you, so you had someone sitting by your side doing the, the re digital retouching and the scanning. And there, so there was like a skills gap, but also then this sort of, this, this way that you weren't allowed to be a sort of amateur or to be playful with the format because actually it cost you 75, 80 quid to produce a print mm. in one of those dark rooms. So the self-publishing, I think, has sort of stepped in as this area where, you know, you're really there noodling about and having what you were describing as that dark room experience, make, you know, mm. making mistakes and experimenting. And, and I think that's where you get to really look at your work, is that point when, when you're in that moment. I mean, for me, it's, you know, it's been... I spend so much time in the studio, like making something, but when I really get to look and think about what it is that I'm making is in that moment when I look at those proofs. And I think that's the same when you, if you're working on a book, I've just started very early stages of working on a book and it's like you look through all this material and, and think about relationships between things and then begin to build something else out of that other than what you had before. And you start to think about, you know, it's a way to think about the work in a completely different way. Yeah. and make a, another work out of it in a way that, be, that becomes a book or becomes something else. Yeah. I think also, like with especially young photographers and a lot of photographers today, they find that experience of maybe if they're, they're putting together their own website or they're trying to organize a PowerPoint to present their work or whatever, um, there's something incredibly rewarding about having to sit down and, and organize images and sequence them and find a way to to tell a story through them and, and find meaning between them. Um, but again, it goes back to that physicality, that when you actually take whatever it is that you've produced in that respect, I mean, that's a rewarding experience, but once it actually is a physical object, yeah. you know, and something that, again, you can share you know, on a physical level, I think that's something that people find incredibly rewarding as well. Well, yeah, I mean, it kind of allows you to up the stakes and be part participate in this sort of broader community without, you know, having to do it by waiting around to see if somebody will take your work to an art fair or mm. a commercial gallery will represent you and do a show every two years. I mean, you know, pre presumably the reasons that we, that photographers are photographers and artists are artists is, is that you want to be in discourse with 
you know, a community and a, be part of something. Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think, yeah, what you're talking about with books is like one way that you realise that another way is like self, you know, people organising shows or yeah. other groupings of work in other ways, which can happen in publications, you know, rather than just the solo artist show yeah absolutely yeah. Aaron, you, you have you always been have had many strings to your bow like being a writer and a curator and no i mean i started off as a photographer and then i started writing because i wanted to talk to photographers <laughs> about their work so it was a good excuse to i couldn't ring up my heroes at the time and say can i come and hang out yeah and just talk about photography because i take pictures too but i could if i said i'm writing an article for a magazine that's part of the reason i started the online magazine it was basically a front in order to get through the door and talk mm. to the people I wanted to talk to. So I could call somebody up and say, hi, I'm from Seesaw Magazine, which is a website, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, can, you know, can I interview you? And they would say yes, you know. Um, so that's when I started writing and engaging with pictures in that way and started editing and that sort of thing. And I really enjoyed it. And I think a lot of, a lot of people, I used to come, well, up until very recently, those things were very compartmentalized. So I, I lectured, yeah. and I edited, and I curated, and I wrote, and I made work. And they were all com compartmentalized. And only, I've only started feeling confident enough to kind of pull them together and, help, and allow those things to merge in, in the last kind of year or so, because I've been given opportunities where I can see the relevance of being able to mix those things, that you can, you can incorporate writing. And, and I mean, a lot of people seem, I've had comments where people think, say, how can you be a critic and a, a maker at the yeah, same time? Yeah. But then again, going back to kind of my historical, you know, I mean, some of my favorite essays about photography are by photographers, whether it's yeah. Tim Davis or Jason Evans or Todd Papa George or, I don't know, there's a, you know, there's a million essays by photographers that are great, that are wonderful. Um, and do you, th do you think that also the, f the fact that last year it has felt okay is not just because of your, your own confidence or development, yeah. but it's also because there's something in the air about working in collaboration and having lots of different facets to your relationship with photography. Yeah, like that's th generally something that's more acceptable. I think a lot of photographers are doing it as well. I mean, the whole yeah. blog explosion as well. Every photographer now it seems, has their blog where they're critiquing other people's work and they're sharing other people's work and they're um, engaging critically and, you know, socially with photography in ways that, that didn't necessarily happen previously or didn't happen in public yeah. with a forum, you know, that was open to an audience. So I think it's become slightly more acceptable for people to kind of stand on both sides of the fence, so to speak, to make photographs and to take, you know, I mean, to to look at photographs and to look for photographs, you know, that kind of, that, that you can do both things and that that's a part of everybody's practice. Everybody's doing research and thinking about photographs and some people put it on paper and some people keep it in their heads, you know, I yeah. don't think there's one thing better than another, but I think it's, slow, it's slowly becoming more allowed to, to play all of those roles rather than it. At least I hope so. I mean, yeah. for my future, if anybody's. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder if it's also to do with the fact that, um, given that we are in the middle of a worldwide recession, and although obviously there are some parts of the contemporary art market that are very um, <coughs> resilient, I wouldn't say that most photography is in the resilient category. Like, you know, I mean, and to a certain degree, I would say, thank God, not everything that's 30 by 40 inches and laminated behind plexi has a market right now and it's sort of retreated back so there's a sense that maybe the sort of full fantasy of what it would mean for photography to be a fully validated part of contemporary art isn't is is temporarily on hold and so but there are still lots of things that are absolutely at stake in the development and the future of photography as contemporary art and it may just be that writing it down or be, you know having the guts to to come onto a stage mm. and talk about the issues is as meaningful and as important for you to do as contemporary art photographers as the waiting game for you know the contemporary art show yeah which um, i'm sure you'll be fine and you'll get just as many shows as <laughs> <laughs> pre-recession but i think at the end of the day also i mean we talked about this a bit before but photography is a media, it's a, it's a way of communicating in a language, and so I think it can integrate. Up until this point within the fine art context, it's been about um, 
form in the sense that there's, there's painting, sculpture, you know, um, and that's the, all of those walls are disintegrating. It's not necessarily about the kind of um, the physical, mm. you know, thing. It's become much more about the ideas and the expression of those ideas. And so f photography is just another one of those media in the sense that it's a way of communicating between people. Yes. And, and it, it's, it's developed into a language that people are trying to, start trying to experiment with whether yeah. it's in books or on the wall or whatever. Mm. Um, and that's, that's really interesting and, and exciting. And, it, and it's becoming, I mean, in the 90s, the, the kind of buzzword was photography is like theater. You know, it's, it's, you know, the world is a stage and we're all players, that whole thing. And now it feels like, for me at least, photography is, is now kind of the written word. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of tangible and quite ethereal thing that doesn't necessarily have to exist in one format or another. It can be spoken, it can be... Yeah. It can be on the page, it can be on a wall. Yeah, so. While you were talking, it just occurred to me, which might be a rubbish thought, which actually photography within the context of contemporary art is actually more definite and more clearly visible than it is within photography in the wider world and all its auspices. As you know, the industries of photography, you know, it collapse or have to reform, and you get this conflation of film, video. Photography. So this idea of the identity of photography as this thing that exists in the sort of editorial, journalistic world is really up for debate. Mm. And actually, because contemporary art photography tends to use technologies which are not the default, so film cameras, large format cameras, makes photographic prints, actually it's very, it's nicely visible within contemporary art as photography. You yeah. know, I mean, actually, it doesn't seem like such a ludicrous term to to be using to describe it. Yeah, well, and what you were saying earlier yeah. about the neutrality, that was really, I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, well, it's really interesting how that changes, isn't it? Because you have this scent, which is the neutrality of the medium that you use. I mean, because for me, that's really important that um, in a way the photograph is as neutral as possible because it's about making an encounter with something that's in the, in the image. So, but what the, what the medium is that feels the most neutral changes with time, of course, and it will continue like endlessly to keep changing. And I think at the moment it's in a like the C type and a digital are both. I don't know. There's not really one thing that is the most neutral, yeah. unnoticeable. Or the, ca or the camera phone, you know. Yeah, that, the camera phone. The neutral, yeah, and so yeah. it's interesting to see how that will change as yeah. well because it's almost like the idea of you know at a certain point in time. The, the medium that carries something, whether that's photography or whether, you know, whatever medium that is, or can almost be unnoticeable or you don't think about it that much unless you pick a particularly archaic or noticeable structure to work in. Mm -hmm. And the way that, yeah, that's moving really fast as well at the moment. Yeah, very fast. Um, I think we should open up for questions. I think we have a roving mic. Um, <coughs> Can you tell me how you reconcile the longevity of photog photographic prints, either silver halide or, or ultrachrome prints or any other form of, of photography, in the contemporary art market? For example, if I bought somebody's print today, I could be certain that in 100 years it would have gradually dissolved and disappeared. What does that, how does that determine the longevity of the contemporary art market? In this in today, because uh, nice question, if yes. the print disappears, you could get it reprinted, but if the photographer hasn't printed it, it simply becomes a generic print of his work, and that generic print could indeed have varied from how you had it before on the wall. And this is something that I've never quite understood in the photographic marketplace as a contemporary art form. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 that's, <laughs> that's okay. you. I mean, if anything that would be reprinted in the future for whatever reason you can be sure would change, would be, would be different anyway because the technology is changing all the time of how we do things and if it would be an analogue print, it's a kind of almost alchemical process anyway. Nothing ever comes out the same, but I think you have to look at it in a similar way as to drawing. You know, the drawings also can fade and disappear if you put them into the wrong lighting conditions. I think in the right conditions, photographs can last for a very long time. I mean, that's, I mean, I think anything can, anything can disappear or fall apart or vanish somehow. Yeah. And perhaps that's something which is, you know, very, 
I mean, that's particular to art. Maybe it's like a, it is quite a fragile thing in itself, and it maybe it's not permanent. Any form. <coughs> Are you, t t why don't you have you still got the mic? Um, are you anxious about... Um, I'm, I'm not anxious about it. I just think it's a difficult thing to reconcile. Do you feel cheated that, you're, that what you bought is going to be here? I'm a working photographer here. and a photographic <laughs> artist as well. And I think it is one of the inherently difficult parts of being a contemporary photographic artist in that people's perceptions of what you produce is temporary. I've right. just finished... Yesterday I went to Cezanne's card uh, series at the Courtauld Institute, for example, which is the most magnificent series of paintings. There are drawings there. They haven't faded. He did them for his peasants. They're still as lively and wonderful today as when he painted them. But if, if it was one of my artworks that were up there and it had been kicking around his stu my studio and so on and so forth, it would not have the same longevity. And I, and I think you're right in the sense that you can reprint things, but you're wrong in the sense that these things have changed from where, how they were originally presented. And, and this is something I find really difficult to reconcile. But, sh but surely the meaning of all works of art is shaped by its context, and once it's out of its original context, I mean, even if a work was to survive 500 years, the context it'd be shown 500 years after it's been produced is going to shape its meaning in ways that weren't intended by the artist. But if it doesn't exist anymore, then that makes it rather difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it, indeed it does. Uh, from a buying point of view, from a commercial point of view, if somebody wants, if right. you put, if you do your art and you want people to invest in it and to buy it, then if it has an inherent characteristic of disappearing, how is that maintained it, in, in the contemporary really, art market? Well, two things come to mind. Is this, one is, is if that's really your motivation as an artist, don't make photographs. Simple as that, because they are future. So, so doesn't that predetermine then, that the contemporary photographic art market or the contemporary photographic artwork is transitory and irrelevant? Well, no, I don't think those two words go together. <laughs> I hate to be the kind of the romantic, but I th you know you could argue that that's one of its most beautiful qualities that it's here today and gone in hundred years, two hundred years, and that whoever buys it gets to enjoy it for that period of time, and if it disappears, it disappears. I think that's a valid you know? point. I don't. I mean, I was saying to Charlotte, I don't know if this is true, but it's a story that I heard from a colleague that that when if you want to go view the. Um, the original Fox Talbot photograph of the window, the kind of quote unquote first photograph until we recently discovered it wasn't the first photograph, but um, uh, you know, it's, co it's covered with um, velvet and, and you're only allowed to view it for something like 40 seconds because it, the life that it's got left in it is only 75 minutes or something like that. So if it's exposed to daylight for 75 minutes, it will all but vanish. You know, I think that's a beautiful, I think that's beautiful that you can only view it for that period of time. So if it disappears, it disappears. But but if somebody's, hopefully the reason somebody's buying your work is not as an investment so that their you know, great, 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 great grandchildren will be millionaires or trillionaires by that time, but that, that they want to enjoy it for their lifetime and it'll last, it'll last their lifetime at least. Yeah. Now I just wanted to support the panel's view. I collect contemporary photography and I have been doing so for the last 20 years and of course there's always that fear of what will happen to the image. And I've got a few vintage prints from the 70s um, which I don't show um, but I sometimes take them out and have a look at them but it's just the sheer pleasure of knowing the image that you've fallen in love with and I think it's a risk you have to take and I think it's absolutely right, you know, art is a fragile medium and I just want to support the panel in that view because I think I agree with your point that the gentleman in the back shouldn't be taking photographs if he's that worried that uh, and, what's going to happen to and, them. And frankly, I've seen way too many people come and present portfolios of platinum prints, which are quite a resilient print of bowls of pears, and you think, I wish somebody would destroy them because <laughs> if, that, if that's what's left. <laughs> Um, something that you kind of haven't talked about that much is, is the digital revolution and how, how that, we, obviously it's still going on, so we don't know what's, what's going to happen. But um, 
Um, do you think that because um, th that, that the vernacular photography is kind of immediate and is online, it's on Facebook, it's on MySpace, that the art photography will kind of go back to the handmade and to kind of go back in a sense and look at what, what is photography as a craft compared to what the digital image is? We all have so much to say on this, so who wants to go first? Clarice, do you want to...? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, but, but you are motivated and you are slightly worried that we won't have family photographs, that you're the last generation. So. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> but it's true that in my work, I mean, I, I first started shooting in films and then I used digital, like digital technology to make my work. So I have to go through different stages, which are like uh, um, scanning and then retouching, you know, but... <laughs> it's tracing now. Okay, well, let's, let's carry on. Um, I, I think, I mean, it'd be really interesting to see actually what happens because, of course, none of us know, and the, it's like the ground is constantly shifting under, mm -hmm. under your feet as a practitioner, you know, with technical stuff at the moment because you think you can do one thing, then that disappears, and then it comes back, and then something else appears, and then there's all these new things going on, but you're not quite sure if they can do what you want them to do yet. Um, but like I... Th Polaroid, for example. Yeah, yeah. Like the Polaroid disappeared, you know, and now they reinvented it, you know, just because, like, yeah. Oh, no, we shouldn't in our generation. Well, I didn't have the time to use Polaroid, and it already disappeared. But no, they just reinvented it. Yeah, they just brought it back. It. So, it's, in a way, it's kind of quite... I don't know. It's sort of frightening and exciting at the same time with, with that what's happening. But I think that what it does do overall is make um, you much more aware of medium as a, as a subject and as a choice. Because I think when I, fir when I first started working with photography, there weren't, there weren't that many choices. There was kind of colour negative, black and white, or colour um, slide, which was sort of already starting to disappear. So, but now I think the, the material of the medium is much more present in the, in the choice that you make and as a subject, and I think that probably will continue to grow. I mean, that's my feeling as well from looking, like in colleges where I've worked with students and seeing the way that they approach like the photographic medium, because like somebody who starts college now on a BA starts with digital as a default, and then they might discover analog if they can be, if they can have the patience or the facilities to learn that. So it becomes, it, it has a completely different sensibility and a feeling to it, I think. So I, I don't really know where it will end up, but I think that medium is, yeah. I think, I mean, within, at least within a fine art context, there's also a really, there's a really interesting precedent, which is the invention of photography and what that did to painting, you know, so the, the painted image and how that's kind of transposed in an interest, you know, when, when photography came along and kind of replaced painting as a, as a pictorial medium, Painting turned to materiality. You know, it became abstract. It became about paint. It became about light, and you know. And I think that transition is happening a lot now, in terms of a lot of contemporary art photographers or people working within, you know, or dealing with, with materiality. Then they're yeah. talking about what is the medium, what is the what is the actual kind of physicality, and and what what is that you know made of. But you wrote. Didn't you wrote an article? <laughs> you wrote, <laughs> the aesthetics of nostalgia. Have you read words about pictures? <laughs> Have you read that? <laughs> um, there's a book, Aperture have just published it, called Words Without Pictures, which is a website that I did when I was at, at, in Los Angeles. And um, lots of people wrote for it, but it was um, artists and curators and academics who had the guts to say something before it's received wisdom. Because I think what's amazing about this moment is, actually, you look back, I, I, I've changed my mind on so Things are happening so fast, I've changed my mind. And what I don't want to do is end up working in this heritage industry of platinum prints, of bowls of pears, or Kodachrome, or Polaroid, and all of that. And somehow that being the sum total of the creative practice of photography. But actually, everything that might consider itself contemporary art photography is re in relation to the fact that 
8 billion photographs were made last year, and most of those weren't made with what we would recognise as a camera, and most of those were never going to be made into a physical print. So I do think that this is the moment when artists do have something really prescient to say about the materiality of photography because of the wider scope of the photographic medium. I love the fact that you said the word revolution because I am a revolution fetishist, you know, bring on the revolution because I think that artists have a really meaningful place within that rather than a comfortable contemporary art market which is you just have a, this thing called a career and you worry about how long you'll pitch, whether they're archival or not. And, you know, photography is this great thing because it reinvents itself and you can come from anywhere. It doesn't, you don't have to go to art school, you don't have to be a master printer. You can come from all of these directions. So I'm hoping that the revolution is, is that, it, it, that photography doesn't become a heritage industry, just servicing a niche part of the contemporary art market. And it really is the revolution. Yeah. Um, please thank your um, brilliant panel this evening. So Aaron, Clarice, and Anne, thank you so much.